Scott turns up here in Sydney around April of 1869, but we're not quite sure what he gets up to. Some suggest he joins a ship and goes to VG. He may have gone back to New Zealand, even the Otago goldfields, because we do know for sure he turns up at the Sydney Mint right behind me with 120 ounces of fine gold dust to sell. The proceeds of 500 pounds, he deposits in his personal bank account at the Union Bank. Three days later, he deposits a further 200 pounds. And he'll live like a gentleman here in Sydney for about 10 or 11 months. In November of 1870, he buys a yacht called Why Not, hires the services of a professional skipper, takes the company of a young lady, and they're sailing for Fiji. But they only get as far as the Sydney Heads, this body of water behind me, and they're intercepted by a police launch. Scott's arrested for passing false checks, and he'll be sent to Maitland Jail for 18 months. But he's not used to prison life, so he pretends to be insane and they transfer him to the Parramatta Insane Asylum. Life is probably not that much more comfortable in the Insane Asylum. Back in Victoria, Braun and Simpson have been acquitted of the Egerton robbery, and with the assistance of friends who've been on the lookout for Scott. And when he gets released in March of 1872, he's arrested shortly after, and he's sent back to Victoria to answer the charges of the Egerton gold robbery. We're at the old Ballarat jail. And this is where Scott will be sent to await trial for the Mount Egerton robbery. But while he's awaiting trial, he escapes, along with five other prisoners. And how does he do it? Well, in those days, they used to lock the prisoners in their cells on a Friday afternoon and not let them out until Monday morning to reduce the number of guards so they could have a nice weekend off. On this particular day, Scott has smuggled in a sharp implement and he's etched out the mortar between the bricks to remove the bricks and make a hole between his cell and the next one along. Now he's been complaining about a stomach ache to the guard and on this occasion he asks for a pail of warm water. The guard returns with a pail of warm water, checks to make sure Scott's at the back of the cell, opens the door, but what he doesn't realise is this prisoner from the next cell along is also in Scott's cell and they overpower him and restrain him. Then they take the keys and let another four prisoners out. Grabbing their sheets and their blankets, they fashion them into a rope. Standing on each other's shoulders, they scale the top of the wall, securing the rope to the top of the wall, and then climb over the top. Now the guard will say that he'd been treated very well during the altercation. At one stage he lost his pocket watch and asked for it to be returned, and Scott did, saying he was such a fine man who would never have stolen anything from him. But fortunately, due to the tenacity of the Victorian police force, these six escapees will be recaptured and returned to Ballarat Jail a few days later. Scott will finally get to stand trial here at Ballarat for the robbery at Mount Egerton. But he does something which is very unusual for the time. He sacks his legal counsel and defends himself. And he spins that out for eight days, testimony to his education and the fact the man could really talk. He also gets Ludwig Braun into the witness box for seven hours and cross-examines him, and that is unprecedented for its time. But it doesn't do him any good at all. He gets 10 years at His Majesty's Prison in Pentridge. He gets one year for escaping here at Ballarat, something which probably hasn't done his cause any good at all. But worth noting is that Sir Redmond Barry, the presiding judge that does the sentencing, is also the judge that will sentence Ned Kelly to be hanged eight years later. We're here in Melbourne, at the Pentridge Prison. And it's here Scott will come and spend just over six years for the Egerton robbery. But he'll meet another inmate, James Nesbitt. Now Nesbitt gets into trouble for bringing Scott tea. An odd thing to get into trouble for, you might think. But it's an equally odd thing to do. And when Scott and Nesbitt are released, they meet up again. And it's this relationship that gets a bit of attention or interest from the paper of the day towards the end of the story but it gets a lot of attention and interest from the modern historians 
and some will go as far as to speculate that Scott and Nesbitt are actually lovers, and there is some evidence to support that theory. Now, Scott carves out a meagre sort of an existence while he's living here in Melbourne by doing public speaking, talking about prison reform and his life here at Pentridge. And he pulls a pretty good crowd. See, Scott's an educated man, he can talk and hold an audience, but it's the young and disenchanted men around town that really he gets a following from. There's a Gus Winicky, he's 15. Tom Rogan, in his late teens, he's already done time at Beechworth. There's a Graham Burnett from a wealthy family around Ballarat and a Thomas Williams. But the papers have this fascination with Captain Moonlight and they're blaming him for every unsolved crime in the colony. Now Moonlight is Scott. The police are also bringing Scott in for questioning over all these unsolved crimes as well. And it's this continual harassment that lead to Scott and Nesbitt in search of a better life. And they decide to leave Melbourne. Could not 